Matatag Curriculum, PE and Health, Grade 4, Quarter 1, Lessons 3 to 6, Current Health, Status, and Body Awareness. Learning competency, relate current health status to body awareness. Objectives, first, discuss personal health issues and concerns. Second, measure the current health status of your own body. And last, realize the importance of valuing one's health. Let's have an activity. Four pick in one word. Instruction. The teacher will show you four pictures that together form a word related to our topic. Your task is to identify the word by combining the clues from the pictures. Once you have figured it out, share or write down the word as instructed. Let's start. Very good. It's fitness. What word can you figure out? Very good. It's health. What word can you figure out? Correct. Skills. Good job. So what are the different words that you identify in the activity? Skills, health, and fitness. Can you distinguish the difference between the three pictures? Can you share your answer to the class, please? The picture about fitness shows people doing exercises like running or lifting weights, highlighting physical activity. The picture about health focuses on overall well-being, such as eating healthy foods or getting a check-up, emphasizing good habits for a balanced life. The picture about skills depicts someone mastering a specific task or hobby, like playing an instrument or cooking, showcasing expertise and practice in a particular area. Number two, analyzing quotations. So directions, give your ideas about the given quotation. Here's the quotation. Health is wealth. Here are the questions that you need to answer. First, explain your idea about the given quotation. Second, how do you know you are healthy? Third, are healthy, can you also consider yourself physically fit? Share your answers to your classmates. Unlucky content area vocabulary, body mass index or BMI. Body mass index is a person's weight in kilograms divided by the square of height in meters. A high BMI can indicate high body fatness. BMI screens for weight categories that may lead to health problems. 
what it does not diagnose the body fatness or health of an individual. Next is hearing tests. Hearing tests are how healthcare providers determine if you have hearing loss. Hearing tests don't require special preparation and don't hurt. Hearing tests may be screenings to see if you can hear or evaluations to find out if you have hearing issues. Next is vision screening test. A vision screening test is a brief test that mainly checks how well you can see things up close and far away. It's also called an eye test. The test usually involves reading letters on an eye chart. A vision screening is a quick way to find out if you need a comprehensive or complete eye exam. Dental examination. A dental exam is part of a checkup of your teeth and gums. Height and weight measurement. BMI or body mass index. What is BMI? BMI estimates how much body fat a person has. It is the result of a calculation that uses a person's height and weight. The doctor plots that number on a chart. There are different charts for girls or boys. Are they important? Yes, BMI is important because it helps track a person's growth and identify potential health issues. By comparing a person's BMI to age and sex specific charts, doctors can see if the person is growing normally or if there might be concerns like being underweight or overweight. This early insight allows for timely changes to diet or lifestyle to support healthy development. Weight gain is the sum of little things that add up over time. Choosing the escalator instead of the stairs, eating two helpings of dinner, and so on and so on. Ever wonder why you're winded or your joints ache and blame it on your age? Well, think about your weight. Imagine carrying a 10-pound bag everywhere you go. Just 10 pounds adds more than 30 pounds of force to your knees. So those achy knees might mean you need better habits. By realizing you're overweight, and by taking control now, you may lower the risk of developing serious health problems like heart disease, high blood pressure, type 2 diabetes, gallstones, and some cancers. Losing just 5% of your body weight may also decrease the stress you're putting on your body. That means doing more of the things you enjoy without the aches and pains. It's the little things that make up the weight gain. And it's the little things that will help take it back off. Wouldn't you like to drop the weight and stop picking up more? Obesity happens one pound at a time. So does preventing it. Let's calculate your body mass index. Body mass index or BMI is a measure of your body fat based on height and weight that applies to adult men and women. Here's the BMI categories. For underweight, Less than 18.5, normal weight, 18.5 to 24.9, overweight, 25 to 29.9, and obesity, BMI of 30 or greater. Take action towards better health. Maintaining a healthy weight. Maintaining a healthy weight is important for your heart health. Being overweight is hard on your heart. It increases your risk of having heart disease, a stroke, high cholesterol, 
high blood pressure and diabetes. Choosing heart healthy food and getting regular exercise will help you achieve and maintain a healthy weight. Also, find ways to reduce stress, which affects energy and hunger, and if chronic, can make your body more or store more fat. Increase physical activity. Moving more can lower your risk factors for your heart disease. Try these activities. First, take a yoga or fitness class with a friend. You can even take a virtual class online with a friend in another city. Second, work on your fitness goals with your spouse or roommate. Third, go for a daily walk with a neighbor or walk with a dog. Third is eat a heart healthy diet. Eating a healthy diet is the key to heart disease prevention. What are the consequences and implications? Moderate and severe thinness. Moderate and severe thinness are classifications used to describe different levels of underweight based on body mass index or BMI. Moderate thinness, BMI between 16 and 16.9, this indicates that a person is underweight and may be at risk for health issues related to insufficient body weight. Severe thinness, BMI below 16. This is a more critical level of underweight and poses higher health risk, including malnutrition and weakened immune function. Addressing these conditions often involves nutritional interventions and medical guidance to ensure proper growth and health. Underweight General cutoff for underweight BMI less than 18.5 is commonly used to identify underweight individuals in both adults and children. While this cutoff is broadly applicable, it may not fully capture varying degrees of thinness or the associated health risk. Moderate and severe thinness Moderate thinness, generally defined as a BMI between 16 and 16.9. Severe thinness, typically defined as a BMI below 16. These more specific cutoffs help identify individuals at greater risk of health complications due to low body weight. Overweight Overweight BMI not less than 25 is a major determinant of many non-communicable diseases, including non-insulin-dependent diabetes mellitus, coronary heart disease, and stroke, and increases the risk for several types of cancer, gallbladder disease, and respiratory symptoms. In some populations, the metabolic consequences of weight gain start at modest levels of overweight. The last one is obesity. Obesity BMI not less than 30 is a disease that is largely preventable through lifestyle changes. The cause attribute attributable to obesity are high, not only in terms of premature death and health care, but also in terms of disability and a diminished quality of life. Let's have an activity. Instructions, draw a heart if the statement is correct and a triangle if it is not. Number one, monitoring height and weight is important to one's health. The correct answer is heart. Number two, BMI means body mass index. The correct answer is heart. Number three, the eyes are the organ used for hearing.
the correct answer is triangle. Number four, normal weight means that the weight is in the healthy range based on the person's age, sex, and height. The correct answer is heart. Number five, amblyopia is a vision development problem in infants and young children. The correct answer is heart. Number six, the hair is the largest organ of the body. The correct answer is triangle. Number seven, personal hygiene is important in maintaining good health. The correct answer is heart. Number eight, each segment of the spine is important to the well-being of the spinal column or cord. The correct answer is heart. Number nine, oral and dental hygiene should be practiced regularly. The correct answer is heart. And last, number 10, halitosis also means bad breath. The correct answer is heart. Good job, kids! And that wraps up today's lesson. If you enjoyed this video and want to see more content like this, don't forget to hit the subscribe button and ring the bell so you never miss an update. Thanks for tuning in and I'll see you in the next video. Thank you! Matatag Curriculum, PE and Health, Grade 4, Quarter 1, Lessons 3 to 6, Current Health Status and Body Awareness. Hello kids! How are you today? Are you ready to learn things about PE and health? Then, let's start! Our topic is about skin, hair, and nails. This is Teacher Aika, your online teacher. Let's go! Learning competency relate current health status to body awareness. Here are the objectives. Discuss personal health issues and concerns. Second, measure the current health status of your own body and realize the importance of valuing one's health. Let us talk about first the skin. The integumentary system includes the skin, hair, and nails. The skin is an organ that performs a variety of essential functions, such as protecting the body from invasion by microorganisms, chemicals, and other environmental factors, preventing dehydration, acting as a sensory organ, modulating body temperature and electrolyte balance, and synthesizing vitamin D. The skin is made of multiple layers of cells and tissues, which are held to underlying structures by connective tissue. The skin is composed of two main layers, the uppermost thin layer called the epidermis, made of closely packed epithelial cells, and the inner thick layer called the dermis that houses the blood vessels, hair follicles, sweat glands, and nerve fibers. Beneath the dermis lies the hypodermis that contains connective tissue and adipose tissue or the stored fat to connect the skin to the underlying bones and muscles. The skin acts as a sense organ because the epidermis, dermis, and hypodermis contain specialized sensory nerve structures that detect touch. 
surface temperature, and pain. The color of skin is created by pigments, including melanin, carotin, and hemoglobin. Melanin is produced by cells called melanocytes that are scattered throughout the epidermis. When there is an irregular accumulation of melanocytes in the skin, freckles appear. Dark-skinned individuals produce more melanin than those with pale skin. Exposure to the UV rays of the sun or a tanning bed causes additional melanin to be manufactured and built up, resulting in the darkening of the skin referred to as a tan. Increased melanin accumulation protects the DNA of epidermal cells from UV ray damage, but it requires about 10 days after initial sun exposure for melanin synthesis to peak. This is why pale-skinned individual often suffer sunburns during initial exposure to the sun. Darker-skinned individuals can also get sunburns, but they are more protected from their existing melanin than pale-skinned individuals. Too much sun exposure can eventually lead to wrinkling due to the destruction of the cellular structure of the skin. And in severe cases, can cause DNA damage resulting in skin cancer. Moles are larger masses of melanocytes. And although most are benign, they should be monitored for changes that indicate the presence of skin cancer. Patients are encouraged to use the A, B, C, D, E mnemonic to watch for signs of early stage melanoma developing in moles. Consult a healthcare provider if you find these signs of melanoma when assessing a patient's skin. A, B, C, D, E stands for A. For asymmetrical, the sides of the moles are not symmetrical. B for borders, the edges of the mole are irregular in shape. C for color, the color of the mole has various shades of brown or black. D for diameter, the mole is larger than 6 mm or 0.24 inches. E for evolving. The shape of the mole has changed. Now, let's talk about the hair. Hair is made of dead, keratinized cells that originate in the hair follicle in the dermis. For these reasons, there is no sensation in hair. Hair serves as a variety of functions including protection, sensory input, thermoregulation, and communication. For example, hair on the head protects the skull from the sun. Hair in the nose, ears, and around the eyes or eyelashes defends the body by dropping and any dust, particles that may contain allergens and microbes. Hair of the eyebrows prevents wet and other particles from dripping into the eyes. Hair also has a sensory function due to sensory innervation by a hair root plexus surrounding the base of each hair follicle. 
hair is extremely sensitive to air movement or other disturbances in the environment. Even more, so that the skin surface. This feature is also useful for the detection of the presence of insects or other potentially damaging substances on the skin surface. Each hair root is also connected to a smooth muscle called the erector pili that contracts in the response to nerve signals from the sympathetic nervous system, making the external hair shaft or stand up. This movement is commonly referred to as goosebumps. The primary purpose for this movement is to trap a layer of air to add insulation. Let's have the nails. The nail bed is a specialized structure of the epidermis that is found at the tips of our fingers and toes. The nail body is formed on the nail bed and protects the tips of our finger and toes as they experience mechanical stress while being used. In addition, the nail body forms a back support for picking up small objects with the fingers. Sweat glands When the body becomes warm, sweat glands produce sweat to cool the body. There are two types of sweat glands that secrete slightly different products. An equine sweat gland produces hypotonic sweat for thermoregulation. These glands are found all over the skin's surface but are especially abundant on the palms of the hand, the soles of the feet, and the forehead. They are called glands lying deep in the dermis, with the duct rising up to a pore on the skin surface where the sweat is released. This type of sweat is composed mostly of water and some salt. Antibodies, traces of metabolic waste, and dermicidin, an antimicrobial peptide. Ecrine glands are a primary component of thermoregulation and help to maintain homeostasis. Apocrine sweat glands are mostly found in hair follicles in densely hairy areas, such as the armpits and genital regions. In addition to secreting water and salt, apocrine sweat includes organic compounds that make the sweat thicker and subject to bacterial decomposition and subsequent odor. The release of this sweat is controlled by the nervous system and hormones and plays a role in the human pheromone response. Most commercial antiperspirants use an aluminum-based compound as their primary active ingredient to stop sweat. When the antiperspirant enters the sweat gland duct, the aluminum-based compounds form a physical block in the duct, which prevents sweat from coming out of the pore. And that wraps up today's lesson. If you enjoyed this video and want to see more content like this, don't forget to hit the subscribe button and ring the bell so you never miss an update. Thanks for tuning in and I'll see you in the next video. Thank you! Matatag Curriculum, PE and Health Grade 4, Quarter 1, Lessons 3 to 6. Current Health Status and Body Awareness
Hello kids! How are you today? Are you ready to learn things today? If yes, then let's start! Our topic in PE and Health 4 is about hearing test, vision test, and scoliosis test. This is Teacher Aika, your online teacher. Learning competency relate current health status to body awareness. Here are the objectives. First, discuss personal health issues and concerns. Second, measure the current health status of your own body. And third, realize the importance of valuing one's health. This time, let us talk about hearing tests. Hearing tests are how healthcare providers determine if you have hearing loss. You may have several hearing tests in your lifetime. Hearing tests are how people can find out if they have hearing loss. Different kinds of hearing tests use different techniques to identify hearing loss. One common test, usually audiometry and the audiogram, to identify hearing loss and show test results. Hearing tests don't require special preparation and don't hurt. What are the types of hearing tests? There are several types of hearing tests. Some tests are typically used to check adults' hearing and others are used for babies, children, and adults. Hearing test types include the following. First, pure tone testing. This common hearing test finds the quietest volume you can hear at each pitch. Children and adults have pure tone testing. Second is bone conduction testing. This test is used to see if you have wax or fluid blocking your outer ear or middle ear, or if hearing loss is present in the sensory cells of hearing. Third is speech testing. Adults and some children may have this kind of hearing test. Speech testing involves listening to and repeating certain words. The test shows how you understand the speech. The fourth one is auditory brainstem response or ABR. This test checks the connections or pathways between your inner ear and brain. Audiologists may use this test to check hearing in children and people who can complete pure tone test. They may also use this test for people who have a brain injury that affects their hearing. The fifth one is Autoacoustic Emissions Test or OAE. Audiologists use this test to check your inner ear function. The fifth one is Tympanometry. This test checks how well your eardrum moves. Audiologists may do tympanometry tests to see if you have a ruptured eardrum, if you have fluid in your middle ear or wax in your ear canal. Next, we have the vision screening. A vision screening is a brief test that mainly checks how well you can see things up close and far away. It's also called an eye test. The test usually involves reading letters on an eye chart, 
A vision screening is a quick way to find out if you need a comprehensive or complete eye exam. A complete exam checks both your vision and eye health. It looks for signs of serious eye disorders that may not have symptoms such as glaucoma. Children provider will use special vision screening tests to look for signs of common eye conditions that need early treatment to prevent long-term loss of vision. These eye conditions include the following. First, we have amblyopia. Children with amblyopia have poor vision that usually happens in just one eye. It's caused by a problem with how the brain and eye work together. It's sometimes called lazy eye. Amblyopia is the most common cause of vision or vision loss in children. The second one is strabismus. This condition causes eye or each eye to look in a different direction. One or both eyes may turn in cross eyes or turn out wall eyes. If strabismus isn't corrected, it can cause amblyopia and permanent eye damage. Screening for problems with near and far vision is used to help find common vision problems that can be corrected with eyeglasses or contact lenses. In certain cases, Eye surgery may also be an option, and these, includes, these conditions include the following. First, we have nearsightedness or myopia. Nearsightedness or myopia is a condition that makes far away things look blurry. Farsightedness or hyperopia. Farsightedness or hyperopia is a condition that makes close up things look blurry. Presbyopia. This is only in middle aged adults and older. This condition makes it hard to see things up close. It's a normal part of aging that makes the lens of the eye less flexible. Presbyopia often begins around age 45. Let's have the scoliosis test. A scoliosis exam allows doctors to see whether the spine has a curve. People with scoliosis can have a single curve, creating a C shape, or a double curve, creating an S shape. Scoliosis exams are physical examinations involving exercise that allow a doctor to see the shape of the spine. They are neither painful nor invasive and they require no preparation. Scoliosis sometimes appears as a child or teenager grows and develops. Detecting scoliosis at this stage allows a doctor to monitor the curve of the spine and recommend treatment if the curve is severe enough to warrant it. A scoliosis exam is a type of physical examination that a doctor performs in their office. There are two types, screening tests which look for warning signs that a person may have scoliosis and diagnostic tests which confirm 
scoliosis and assess the severity of the curve in the spine. A person with a positive screening test may require diagnostic test. Previously, scoliosis screenings were part of routine child health visits. Now, concerns about the overdiagnosis and overtreatment mean that many organizations do not recommend this approach. Those in favor of screening recommend that it take place twice in females age 10 to 12 years and once in males age 13 to 14 years old. What do doctors look for during the exam? In scoliosis exams, a doctor will look for external signs that can indicate scoliosis. These signs include the following. First, one shoulder blade being higher or more prominent than the other. Second, one shoulder being visibly higher than the other, from either the front or the back. Third, more space between the body and the arm on one side when standing with the arms hanging loosely. Fourth, skin creases on one side of the waist. It, one hip that is higher than the other. Sixth, a head that does not appear centered within the pelvis. Test during a scoliosis exam. The main screening test for scoliosis is the Adams test which doctors may also call a forward bend test. During this test, a person removes their shirt so that the spine is fully visible. Then, they bend forward with their knees straight and their feet together, allowing the arms to hang freely. This position can allow doctors to see First, a visible curve in the spine. Second, asymmetries in the shoulders, shoulder blades, or waistline. Third, a hump or elevation of the rib cage on one side. If there are signs of scoliosis, a doctor may place a scoliometer on the curved area. This device measures the angle of the curve. Neither the Adams test nor a scoliometer can provide an entirely accurate picture of what the spine looks like and the significance of the curve. If the physical exam indicates a scoliosis, a doctor will refer the person for medical imaging to confirm a diagnosis. And that wraps up today's lesson. If you enjoyed this video and want to see more content like this, don't forget to hit the subscribe button and ring the bell so you never miss an update. Thanks for tuning in and I'll see you in the next video. Thank you! Matatag Curriculum, PE and Health, Grade 4, Quarter 1, Lessons 3 to 6. Current Health Status and Body Awareness Good day kids! How are you today? Are you ready to learn new lesson? Then, let's start! Our topic for today is about Dental examinations. This is Teacher Aika, your online teacher. 
learning competency relate current health status to body awareness. Objectives First, discuss personal health issues and concerns. Second, measure the current health status of your own body and realize the importance of valuing one's health. So now, let's focus in dental examination. Dental examination. Poor oral health can affect your general health too. For example, losing teeth can cause problems with eating and nutrition, which can lead to other health problems. You can help prevent oral health problems with regular visits to the dentist and good toothbrushing and flossing habits at home. A dental checkup, you'll usually see both a dentist and a dental hygienist. A dentist is a doctor who has special training to care for teeth and gums. A dental hygienist is a healthcare professional trained to clean teeth and teach you how to take good care of your teeth and gums. Dentists can treat people of all ages. There are also pediatric dentists who have received additional training on dental care for children. Getting regular dental examinations is a large component of preventative dentistry. A dental exam serves as an opportunity for a dentist to clean your teeth and look for dental problems like gum disease and tooth decay. This is also a time to examine the face, mouth, and neck for abnormalities like oral cancer. During a dental examination, you can learn important factors that affect overall health like a good oral hygiene and eating the right foods. Important components of your dental examination, each visit to your dentist will be different. But most dental examinations contain these five key parts. Let's have the first one. As was mentioned earlier, one of the treatments dentists perform during a routine examination is professional cleaning. This is done to remove tartar and plaque from the teeth. Tartar is calcified plaque that forms when plaque sits on teeth surfaces for prolonged periods. While plaque can be removed with toothbrushing, and flossing. Tartar cannot. Over time, it will eventually give your teeth a yellow tint. And it also serves as a base for acid-producing bacteria. During the cleaning, the dentist will use a metal tool to remove tartar from teeth surfaces. The dentist will floss the teeth and polish them after the cleaning. Regular teeth cleanings go a long way when it comes to keeping teeth looking their best and free of decay. The second one is visual inspection. A visual inspection is another important part of a dental examination. During the procedure, the dentist will carefully examine the teeth, looking for signs of any dental issues. It is often much easier to treat dental issues during their early stages, so the importance of early detection cannot be overstated. The dentist's findings often determine what other treatments 
you may need during the visit. The third one is the oral cancer screen. Oral cancer is a deadly disease that you cannot treat when detected during the early stages. Your dentist will likely be the first medical professional to see the things of this cancer. The dentist will examine the neck, mouth, and face to look for any irregularities. Fourth is the fluoride treatment. The dentist will assess your fluoride needs during the examination. If your teeth are susceptible to tooth decay, you may receive a fluoride treatment. Fluoride protects teeth from decay for up to six months. The dentist may also recommend other preventative treatments like a fluoride varnish or a dental sealant. The fifth one is the bite inspection. The dentist will also look at your jaw and how your teeth align. X-rays may be done to get a better view of what is going on underneath the gums. Or the dentist might make an impression of the teeth. The dentist will recommend appropriate solutions for any bite issues that are detected. Let's go with identification of health concerns and corrective actions. How to identify the health concerns. Here's a simple way to identify health concerns. Number one, feelings. If you feel sick, tired, or in pain, it might be a sign to tell someone. Number two, body changes. Notice if your body feels different, like sudden weight changes, or if you have a rash or other new spots. Number three, eating and sleeping. If you're not eating or sleeping well, it might be a problem. Number four, mood. If you're feeling very sad, worried, or angry a lot, it's good to talk to someone about it. And number five, talking to adults. Always tell a parent, teacher, or nurse if something doesn't feel right or if you're worried. They can help figure out what to do. Next, we have what corrective actions can apply for individuals' health concerns. Find out if something might be wrong with your health, pay attention to how you feel. If you're in pain, very tired, or if your body looks or feels different, like a new rash or weight change, it's important to tell an, an, an adult. Also, notice if you're not eating or sleeping well, or if you feel really sad or worried. Always talk to a parent, teacher, or nurse if you're unsure about something so they can help you feel better. Faster! I'm exhausted. I can't feel my legs anymore. Keep it up, Sufa. Let's cross the finishing line together. Why don't you look drained at all? And you seem to enjoy running so much. It's actually fun to do physical activities together, and it's good for our health, too. The World Health Organization recommended that children and youth aged 5 to 17 should accumulate at least 60 minutes of moderate to vigorous physical activity, such as brisk walk, ball games, or walking up and down the stairs every day. Slightly increased breathing and heart rates along with mild sweating indicate your physical activity has reached the desired intensity, and you will be able to stay healthy. It's not difficult at all to reach a cumulative 60 minutes of physical activity. Make good use of the time before and after school. You can walk briskly to school and back home under safe conditions. 
You can take part in different physical activities and loosen up a bit during recess and lunch break. How about with chores when you get home? Sweeping and mopping the floor are also good physical activities for us. Cycling with your family or taking a walk with them. As a result, you have reached the 60 minute mark. It sounds simple. What physical activities do you like? Besides brisk walk and playing in the park, I also play sports, such as swimming, rope skipping, and badminton. There are many kinds of physical activities. You can easily find one that best suits you. What are the benefits of doing regular physical activities? There are many benefits. Look at me. I don't get out of breath easily. That's because sufficient physical activities help boost your cardiorespiratory endurance as well as strengthen muscles. It even lowers the risk of cardiovascular disease. Physical activities also keep your muscles and bones healthy, speed up metabolism, and reduce the building up of fat. That's not all. Doing exercise can help relieve anxiety and depression. It even has a positive impact on studying. No wonder you are so optimistic. You also get good grades, and you are friends with everyone. Fine. Stop singing praises to me. But a healthy lifestyle truly helps us stay healthy physically and mentally. All it takes is a little time every day, and I can have all these benefits. I should start engaging in different types of physical activities daily. Join, Join us today, today in developing an active, active and healthy, healthy lifestyle. lifestyle. Let's have an activity. Here is a card that shows some situation about your health concern. Answer the question using a pattern just like line, box, and diagonal. The first to complete the pattern wins the bingo. Good luck! Improve your chances for good health. Understanding health risk. Health risk can sometimes be confusing, but they are important to understand. Knowing the risk you and your family may face can help you find ways to avoid health problems. It can also keep you from fretting over unlikely threats. Knowing the risk and benefits of a medical treatment can help you and your doctor make informed decisions. Risks are all around us. A nearby sneeze may raise your risk for catching the flu. Obesity boosts the odds you'll get diabetes. Smoking increases your risk for many cancers. And if you pay attention to news headlines, you may worry that you're, you're at risk for food poisoning, Zika infection, shark attacks, and more. Let's talk about illness, tips to help you recover. Medical conditions, illness, or injury are frequently stressful and may disrupt our lives. A healthy diet, regular exercise, sleep, and social support can relieve and manage the symptoms of illness or injury and help improve recovery. Taking a positive view can also make a huge difference to recovery from illness. Worrying or negative thinking Worrying or thinking negatively about possible situations can be harmful. It adds to your levels of anxiety or stress and can adversely affect your health. Some strategies to reduce worrying include the following. Let's do it one by one. First, when you start to worry, write down your concerns and the possible consequences, both negative and positive. Look at each scenario and think about possible good points. Remind yourself that you can and will be able to cope. Second, seek out information about your prognosis and likely outcomes. Third, 
realistically assess your worries and think about other things. Talk to a friend or to a psychologist. Fourth, find a variety of activities to focus on each day. For example, reading, walking, or watching a movie. Even if you can only manage short periods at a time because you find activity difficult, make sure your day is varied and challenging. Let's talk about stress and tension. Stress and tension can affect you physically in many ways, including increased muscle tension and chronic contraction. This may be experienced as tension in the eyes, jaw, neck, shoulders, lower back, and stomach. Prolonged muscle tension can lead to aches and pains, such as headaches, migraine, backache, muscular spasms, and injury. To help reduce stress and physical tension, let's do the following. First, learn to recognize the signs of tension in your body. Stop regularly and think about how muscles in your body feel. Identify those muscles that seem most tense when you feel stressed. Second, regularly practice slow and deep breathing, particularly when you feel tense or stressed. Deep breathing using abdominal muscles is preferable to shallow breathing relying on chest muscles. Third, learn to take time out to relax. For example, think of pleasant images and listen to music to calm you. Fourth, learn a deep muscle relaxation technique such as progressive muscle relaxation that is a method of systematically contracting and relaxing your muscles. See a psychologist for training. And of course, we have diet, exercise, and sleep. A healthy diet, regular exercise, and adequate sleep can help you to cope with a medical condition illness or injury, sometimes medication and treatment for a condition, or the pain caused by it, can have an impact on your appetite, energy levels, and sleeping patterns. Talk with your doctor about ways of managing these unwanted effects of medication. First, we have to improve your diet, and to maintain a healthy diet, we have to do the following. First, eat regularly throughout the day rather than one or two heavy meals. Second, choose nutritious foods that you enjoy eating. Third, if you don't feel like eating, try having small amounts often. And fourth, avoid inappropriate foods don't have them in the house. And fifth, tell your family and friends about your diet needs so they can support you. Of course, we need to keep active. Regular exercise promotes health and well-being and helps prevent injury. Do some physical activity every day. Even if it is only a small amount, see your specialist for advice on your exercise that will suit your condition. Next, we have get enough sleep. Sleep is very important if you have a medical condition. To help you get enough sleep, first, try not to nap during the day. Second, lie in bed only if you plan to sleep, not for other activities like watching TV. Third, don't have stimulants such as tea or coffee at night. 
And fourth, exercise during the day so your body is ready for sleep at night. Next, get the support you need. Social support can help you maintain your quality of life when you are ill. To help you find and maintain support, first, plan to catch up with family and friends. Keep a regular schedule of contact throughout each week. Tell your family and friends about your condition and let them know how they can help you. And last, consider new sources of support such as support groups, clubs, interest groups, and volunteer opportunities. Learners takeaways. In your notebook, write below a one-week full meal that you are eating. So we have Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. You have to write what meal did you eat during breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And also, answer the following questions. First, how do you prepare your food? And second, what lesson did you learn from our discussion? And next, we have the formative assessment. So, draw a heart if the statement is correct and triangle if it is not. Number one. Monitoring height and weight is important to one's health. Is it a heart or triangle? Correct, a heart. Number two, BMI means body mass index. Is it a heart or a triangle? Correct, that is a heart. Number three, the eyes are the organ used for hearing. Is it a heart or a triangle? Exactly, that is a triangle. Number four, normal weight means that the weight is in the healthy range based on the person's age, sex, and height. Is it a heart or triangle? Correct, that is a heart. Number five, amblyopia is a vision development problem in infants and young children. Is it a heart or a triangle? Correct! That is a heart! Number 6. The hair is the largest organ of the body. Is it a heart or a triangle? It's a triangle! Good job! Number 7. Personal hygiene is important in maintaining good health. Is it a heart or a triangle? It's a heart! Number 8. Each segment of the spine is important to the well-being of the spinal column or cord. Is it a heart or triangle? It's a heart! Good job! Next, number 9. Oral and dental hygiene should be practiced regularly. Is it a heart or triangle? It's a heart! And last but not the least, number 10. Halitosis also means bad breath. Is it a heart or a triangle? It's a triangle. Good job, kids! And that wraps up today's lesson. If you enjoyed this video and want to see more content like this, don't forget to hit the subscribe button and ring the bell so you never miss an update. Thanks for tuning in and I'll see you in the next video. Thank you!